On the day of his middle school graduation, Mariah stood at the top of the building, and only darkness clouded his mind. Having lived his life without any happiness, he decided to passionately hug the ground. He nosed dive to make a somersault into the cement, but an angel caught him, and he thought he was being taken to heaven. However, the angel introduced herself as Nase, and she's glad to have saved him from becoming a pancake. Mariah struggles to believe this reality and sees his reflection floating in the window. He still wants to be made a flat pancake, having already given up ever since his brother and parents died seven years ago, and when his aunt and uncle took him in. He would watch as his parents enjoyed actual time with their kids, while he was just locked up in their trash room. He became nothing but a tool for them, and slept every single day in that room alone shivering. He thought there was no longer any hope in his future, but Nase flew him away and told him she's a special rank angel. She has the powers to give him everything in this world, whether he wants freedom or love. Mirai definitely thinks he ate something expired or actually hit the ground and he's entered Nirvana, but the angel tells him to start with freedom. Since he's been nothing but a slave his entire life, she offers him wings to fly and be free everywhere in this world. Additionally, if he wants love, she can summon a magical crystal arrow, and whoever is hit by it will fall instantly in love with him. Either the wings or arrows, she can give him as a last salvation. But Mirai doesn't want to choose, so he commands her to give him both of them. Nase tells him she will, and says it was just tradition to phrase it like he can choose one. Mirai has had enough of this trip and decides to go back to hugging the ground. But Nase throws the magical circles to give him an armband and a necklace. He doesn't need to worry, though, because only people who also have angels will be able to view them. This is going to be his life until a new god is chosen, but she tells him to just try flying already. With a single thought of flying, his wings materialize from thin air, and he takes off at super speed towards the sky. He struggles to control his speed through the clouds, but eventually makes it above them and sees the sunset. All night he spent flying, thinking it felt more amazing to fly than he ever imagined, and began crying. He makes it back to the city and thinks there might be some hope to live after all. Today was St. Patrick's Day in Tokyo, and he remembered giving his childhood love the four-leaf clover. While sitting and looking at the sky, Nase comes again and tells him he can steal anything he would ever want with his super speed. And with the arrow, he can make anyone fall in love with him and do anything. Mirai doesn't understand how she can call herself an angel since she's preaching the actions of a devil. But Nase tells him devils don't exist. If anything, they're inside the hearts of evil people like his uncle and aunt who killed people. Mirai wonders what she's talking about, and she reveals that his uncle and aunt were the ones who killed his parents. This entire time, he'd been bullied by them and treated like a slave. Mirai's mind breaks, thinking the angel must be lying to claim they killed his family. But Nase tells him to use the arrow to find out for himself. He flies back home, and his aunt tells him to hurry up and move from the doorway already. Mirai wants to ask her something, but she tells him to shut up and hurry up. He points his arm towards her and releases white liquid directly on her chest. Sorry I meant fires an arrow directly into her chest. When she gets up, his aunt rushes towards him and is ready to develop plot with her massive cannons. But Mirai pushes her off. He asks her if they were the ones to end his family, and she breaks down and blames it all on her husband. His uncle enters the room and sees his wife crying, but she reveals everything. Her husband is the one who rigged the car to blow just to steal his family's fortune, and his memories of that day flash in his head. His parents had went to drive his brother to school, and he was going to get his project ready, but when his father turned the car on, it exploded. They continue wrestling and his wife reveals that it was all for the insurance money. The thought of them doing this for money breaks Mariah's mind, and he says they should have been the ones to die instead. His aunt hears this, and the next thing he knew, his aunt wanted to know what Nirvana was like. Nase explains that this is the power of his red arrow. If someone has done something that deserves trying to meet the Buddha, then they will meet the Buddha if he commands it. He collapses, realizing how easily people die. He's still alive after all of this, and he remembers the memories his mother left him with. When he showed her his family portrait, his mom told him that everyone is born with the goal of finding happiness and trying to attain greater happiness so she wanted him to live a happy life. At that moment, it became clear to Mirai. He must try to keep living to reach happiness, and the angel tells him that he's right, and she's here to make sure she can help him become happy. She finally introduces herself as Nase, and she's going to be his personal angel. A few days later, Mirai sits in the hotel. He's broke and couldn't afford a room, so he used the arrow to get the staff to let him stay here. Even if he can steal everything through this power, none of it would make him happy. 
He wants to have an ordinary sense of happiness, but first he needs to start making money. Nasse tells him to end his uncle and kids to take back all the money they made off him. However, Mirai can't handle the idea of seeing all the gore like the previous time. So instead, he can use the other white arrow she granted him. This white arrow instantly kills people peacefully, and she tries to explain the reason behind all these abilities. God has become weak after a long life of attempting to make Earth a better place. He appointed 13 angels to find humans who will be capable of serving as the new God, and Nasse was excited to finally allow Mirai to be happy. They had a time limit of 999 days, and they all set off. What in the f***ing Mirai Nikki is this shit? After listening to all of this, Mirai, wait, even his f***ing name is Mirai. On the TV, he sees a person being followed by an angel, and sees that he's manipulated five women to fall in love with him. Mirai wonders if there's a way to protect himself from being shot, and Nase goes on to explain the rules of the arrow. The only way for someone to avoid an arrow is by flying faster using the wings. Additionally, the effects of red arrows expire after 33 days, and you can only shoot a person once. Finally, you can at most shoot 14 arrows within 33 days, which is probably what the person on TV did. Inside a car, plot develops, I mean a lot of plot develops, I mean way too much plot develops. They beg him for some protein shake, but as he thinks this life is amazing, some mega man suit in armor opens the car door and points a white arrow at him, instantly ending him. He takes his red arrow, and flies away. The next day, Mirai reads the news about the guy dying, and the angel brings his body back to heaven. Luda, the angel carrying him, is glad that this person perished. While walking through the city, Nase congratulates him on getting into his top high school, and thinks he must be really smart for shooting his uncle with a red arrow to confess. She tries to cheer him up but realizes this guy snorts depression instead of copium, so she asks him why he's not as happy as he should be. He reveals that he's mostly scared about the death of the other god candidate. Inside the center of the city, a bank robbery is taking place, but Superman's rip-off appears to save the day, Metropolitan. What a f***ing name. He begins flying above the police, shooting them all with red arrows and claims that he is here to save the day. He faces off with the criminal and approaches him, vanishing right next to the person to block their gun. He shoots him with the red arrow, and the criminal agrees to turning himself in. His comrade, however, attempts to end Metropolis, but he ends up firing at his own friend instead. The criminal fires the shotgun, and Metropolis vanishes before the bullets reach him, readying a white arrow and ending the criminal. Nase realizes that his angel must be a special rank, and Metropolitan goes on to announce that there are 12 enemies that are aiming for him. He's already defeated one, so he announces on every television station that he's looking to end the other 11. Mirai commands Nase to disappear before Metropolitan sees her. He tries to blend in with the crowd and heads home. Later that day, he asks for Nase to revoke his god candidate status. Even though she saved his life, he doesn't want to be killed by Metropolitan. However, she reveals that taking away his arrow and wings would end his life. After all, those wings and arrow were given to him only because he gave up on everything. It was God's command to only select candidates ready to give up on life. She tells him that special ranks angels give wings, red arrows and white arrows, while first ranks give both wings and arrow, and second ranks only gave wings or arrows. However, an angel's rank can change at any point, and Mirai wonders what he should do in this situation. The next day, he heads off to school without Nase, and she tells him to shoot Saki, his childhood crush, with a red arrow. He should try to make her fall in love with him within those 33 days, but Mirai pledges he won't use the arrow to do that. He goes to school and thinks that today will be his first fresh start, but in the sky, an angel appears. The thought of it strikes fear into him, but he tries to pretend like it doesn't exist. However, in that instant, the angel realizes his presence and vanishes before him, shocking Mirai. This reaction confirms that Mirai is a god candidate since he can see the angel, and the angel reveals his god candidate is standing right behind him. He sees Saki, and she shoots him with her red arrow. Even though he's been shot by the arrow, he's always been in love with Saki. But the arrow's power compels him to confess. She tells him her parents aren't home and that he can come over, so the simp flies at sonic speed to her house. He waits inside her room until she finally appears. Saki goes on to ask him if he possesses white arrows, and he confesses that he does. The angel worries that he's Metropolitan, but says that he isn't. Revel, the angel, tries to explain the reason behind shooting him with the arrow. He wants him to become Saki's wings since she doesn't have any. 
Mirai agrees to become her wings, and they form a pact with each other by putting their hands together. The simp climaxes, and a bond forms around their hands. He hugs her from behind and climaxes again, so he takes off before she notices. They fly together in the sky and Mirai remembers the times they used to spend together as kids. He takes her above the sky and tells her to let him know if anything's bothering her because he'll always be there for her. Saki tells him that it's a personal problem but she'll be fine. She's glad to have talked with him, however, and she tears up. After a while, Saki gets news of Metropolem and going on a TV station at 6 p.m. The angel warns him that he might kill Saki if Metropolem and continues living. So Saki's red arrow compels him to find him. He says if it comes down to it, he will sacrifice himself for Saki. However, Nase appears and tells him not to be so rash. She knows this was probably Revel's plans, the angel of mischief. If he was to die, then his wings and arrow would transfer to Saki. But if Metropolemon died, then the arrow would have compelled him to give those wings and arrows to Saki as well. Either way, Revel would have won. This horrible plan is the reason that Revel is a second rank angel, and Nase's purity is what makes her a special rank angel. Revel confesses that he was just trying to set them up, but agrees that he will form a truce so they can both succeed. However, he's still worried about Murai's actions once the arrow wears off, but Nase assures him that Murai climaxes to Saki at least once a day. Stop it! Get some help! Revel is creeped out. A month passes of them spending time together, and they tie Murai to a chair to make sure he won't do anything to Saki. Revel believes that these are his true feelings, and Murai isn't angry at Saki for shooting him because he at last got to confess his feelings and realized how important it is. He will not allow someone like Metropolemon to ruin his happiness with her, and Saki agrees because she's been wanting to be happy since she's been with him. Mirai sees her blushing and climaxes, and the angel asks him if he's still under the arrow's effects. Poor guy can't stop climaxing. The news station comes on and Metropolemon asks for all the other candidates to come and reach a peaceful solution with him. At the baseball stadium, he will be awaiting all the other candidates. Mirai wonders how people who aren't in Japan would make it without wings, but Nase tries to explain that all the god candidates are from Japan because people like to meet the Buddha in Japan. Mirai tries to think of a plan of attack. At the stadium the next day, Mirai sees angels hovering over the sky and wonders just how many god candidates are going to be there. Saki warns him to stop staring before the angels notice him, and Mirai prepares for the moment to shoot Metropolemon with a red arrow. At 3 p.m., Metropolemon appears before everyone on the field, and soon after, yellow and blue Power Rangers appear, possessing both red arrows and wings. They fire the red arrow at Metropolemon, but it can't pierce through, causing them to realize this was a trap after all. This is likely just a random person who was shot with his arrows and dropped here to lure out the other god candidates. They try to call out for Metropolemon, and think that this plan will finally turn their life around. One of them remembers entrance exam results being posted, and how he was crushed for being rejected. He sat alone and another man came crying for also being rejected. He had failed once already, but the guy in the green shirt had failed three times already. Before hugging the ground, they decided to enjoy every last moment of their life. As the last train started coming, angels appeared before both of them and granted them the arrows along with wings. They understood the laws and the government better than anyone else, so they promised each other to make it to the top and make a better life for each other. They know that a god candidate can only shoot an arrow every two seconds and that the arrow's range is only 31.6 meters, making this baseball field the best place for an attack. Nase and Revel didn't even know that the arrows had such a specific range. And finally, the screen turns on with Metropolemon's face. He reveals that they were correct about the Metropolemon in front of them being a fake, and goes on to show his red and white arrows, explaining that he can fire arrows every 0.3 seconds instead of 2 seconds since he has two of them. He bids them farewell, but the men restrain his fake copy. A girl starts flying in the sky and begs the two others to take her with them since she's scared of Metropolemon. She doesn't want to die after being bullied all her life, and Murai realizes that Saki was likely going through something as well. She allows them to shoot her with a red arrow, but as she approaches, Metropolemon takes a red arrow and shoots her, telling them that they can't hesitate like that. He disappears once more and promises to get rid of them since they were so slow. The men try to form an alliance with all the other god candidates here, and promise to work with them to take Metropolemon down. Before they knew it, a pink and green Power Ranger enter the chat. They shoot the green and pink Power Ranger with red arrows to form their alliance, but while they're distracted, something changed about Metropolem and behind them. The announcer goes on to announce that the Super Civilization squad of Metro 5 has assembled.
They think that they have the numbers advantage here, but Mirai feels like something is off. The two Power Rangers ask them to reveal their arrows, but they say that they don't know what those are. The giant screen turns on once more, and Metropolimon tries to speak, but announces that he's not the actual Metropolimon. The real one is behind them, and he prepares two arrows to shoot directly at them. The blue Power Ranger is knocked out by the white arrow, and the yellow one is hit directly with the red one. The yellow one has now become the servant of Metropolimon, and asks if he could know how this happened. Metropolimon reveals that green and pink were actually just humans who were obeying him to distract them from Metropolimon's location. But Yellow wonders how they were able to be shot with red arrows. Metropolimon reveals he can control people without red arrows, and explains that he can do anything with money. He sees the angel trying to sneak out without handing him the wings and arrows, but commands it to hand them off before leaving. He has now gained a total of four arrows and two wings. Now for the spectacle of the show, he has tied up Power Ranger Yellow with the girl, and he wants to test the limits of the red arrow. Yellow promises that he would do anything, but then Metropolimon commands him to die. Yellow rejects that command, so Metropolimon goes on to point a white arrow towards him. Yellow begins trying to fly for his life but the restraints keep him from moving. Metropolimon fires the white arrow, and Yellow has entered Nirvana. Next is the girl, and Revel is worried that Mirai is going to try and intervene. He struggles to think of what to do in this situation, knowing that if he hesitates even slightly, he could end his and Saki's life. The angel tries to stop Metropolimon from shooting the girl, and she begins yelling for someone to help her. Metropolimon continues trying to provoke the other god candidates to react. As soon as he activated the ring around his neck, an angel told him not to move, and he saw Nase flying in the sky. While he looked up, a person took a photo of them. Nase told him not to act without a plan, or he'd be revealing his god candidate status and lose his life in an instant. She flies over Metropolimon, telling him that the girl won't be luring out any more god candidates. After hearing those words, Metropolimon realized that she'd served her purpose and fired his white arrow towards her, leaving her collapsing onto the ground. Everyone in the crowd was disgusted at what they just witnessed. But Metropolimon was disappointed that he wasn't able to eliminate another candidate using the girl. However, Nase revealed that the only person she wanted to die would be him next, because he's standing in the way of her partner's happiness. So she promised that she'll make her partner end him, and flew into the sky, telling every god candidate to head home for the day. The angels began taking away the souls of the dead, and threw over the wings and arrows, leaving only eight candidates remaining. Back at Saki's home, both of them sat crushed at the fact that they were powerless, but Mirai swore that he needed to eliminate him. However, he couldn't bring himself to hate a person, let alone end their life, so Saki told him that they should form an alliance with the other god candidates, especially since they all hate him. As she let those words out, a man outside her window said he's down with that idea, but Mirai ran to point his red arrow at him. But the man told him that he can shoot him with the red arrow right now if he didn't believe his words. However, Nase told him not to fire his arrow, because she could tell that the man is being honest. After they brought him inside, the man revealed that he doesn't have much time left, because he has terminal cancer that would soon end his life. On the day when he was supposed to die, an angel had appeared before his eyes, but rather than taking his soul away, the angel tried to give him a last shred of hope, and promised that she would give him another shot at life. If he was to become the god of this world before his life was extinguished, his life would be saved from this illness. Hearing those words, the man turned towards his family's photo and realized he could finally give his children and wife the life they deserve. Even though he jumped at the opportunity at first, he quickly realized that he likely won't be alive within 999 days and had to do everything he could with his arrows. The first thing he did was fire his red arrow on rich people to take millions of dollars for his family. But he knew a thief like him didn't deserve to be a god. Because of that, his only wish now was to make sure that Metropolimon wouldn't become the god of this world, because it would destroy his family's life. So he shot 14 people and sent them to the stadium in order to locate any of the other god candidates. And when he saw their photos, he knew that both of them were good people. After hearing his story, Mirai decided to help him achieve his goals, but on the condition that he continues his treatment, because he believes it's selfish of him to be okay with just passing away, and leaving his family in despair. On the other side of the country, Metropolimon wondered how he could use his three new arrows. With the red arrows being basically useless at eliminating another candidate, he wondered how he could force them to eliminate someone else instead. Back at Saki's house, the man finally introduced himself as Nanato, and told them that his angel was Barret, the angel of knowledge. 
Before he left, he showed them his costume ideas for concealing their identities and flew out of their window. The following morning at school, Metropolimon's friend came up to him calling him Candidate and told him to go spy on his crush. While they watched the archery team shooting the arrows, Kanade asked Minami what he'd wish for if he could have any wish granted. But when Minami said he wanted to become extremely rich, Kanade told him that he was wrong, because it should be something that affects the whole world. Minami thought he'd wish for all ugly girls to disappear, and Kanade thought that was more like it. So he revealed that his true wish would be the ability to bring back the dead and Minami realized he was talking about his little sister. When the girls disappeared, Kanade leaped out of the window and aimed down the 60-meter range. A single arrow may only shoot 31.6 meters away, realizing that he can combine even more to reach over 100 meters in distance. Later that day, Kanade flew with a bouquet of flowers to an old mansion where he saw his sister's crystallized body and wished her a happy birthday. At the same time, Mirai saw a car crash on the news and a note left by a girl that said she was following Metropolimon's orders. The Angel of Mischief tried to explain that Metropolimon has around five arrows now from the people he murdered, so he could have given some of them to a person after shooting them with a red arrow, but only for the 33 days they were controlled by the arrow. After hearing those words, Mukato suggested eliminating the girl, because right now, she's flying around the world and eliminating whoever she pleases. However, he knows that the girl is likely just a bait for him to lure them out, so they'll counter-trap him instead, and end his life with a white arrow. At that point, the girl can go back to being innocent, but Mirai couldn't fathom the idea of ending another person's life with a white arrow. Still, Mukato reminded him that they needed to do this as self-defense, but Mirai said he'd rather be bullied than bully someone, and be eliminated rather than eliminate someone, so Mukato tried putting it in a different perspective. He asked him what he would do if Saki was being threatened by Metropolimon, because in that situation, hesitation would be the same as her life ending. But when he tried making up his mind, seeing the fate that lied ahead of him was unfathomable. He collapsed onto the ground, realizing that he couldn't kill him with a white arrow. Meanwhile, Kanade realized that even if his plan to lure the god candidates doesn't work, at least he will make Minami's wish come true of eliminating all the ugly girls in the world. The following day, while they were watching murder news on TV, Nenato told them about his intentions to annihilate Metropolimon, since the nutcase wouldn't stop causing chaos in the city. He showed them his weapons, which he was looking to end him with, and gave Mirai and Saki a gun to join in the fight. But they refused taking it, since neither of them thought they could actually use it. They saw Misurin on the news, who had ended another girl, and was looking to draw them out by setting herself up as bait. Since Metropolimon was trying to annihilate the rest of them, they wondered if they had to take the risk, as he could be lurking around, waiting for his moment to end them. Nanato suggested they walk into the trap, but have Mirai shoot Metropolimon with a red arrow when he came for his prize. With a red arrow in him, Mirai could turn him to his own busboy and order him around to buy McDonald's. Thinking their plan could work out, they decided to take on the challenge and dressed up in battle suits. Nanato asked if Mirai would end Metropolimon with his white arrow if he had a chance to do so, but Mirai told him that he couldn't even squash a cockroach feasting on his food because he was so weak that his middle name was Weakling. Realizing Mirai was hopelessly useless, Nanato agreed to do all the dirty work and to annihilate Misurin before she ended more people. On the tower, Misurin was watching an anticlimax video when Nanato appeared, demanding for Metropolimon's whereabouts. But immediately, the tower exploded, leaving Mirai screaming in horror. As he watched the fumes, afraid to have lost his friend, he saw Nanato falling to the ground and flew to save him. But as he did, they crashed to the floor. Mirai began crying. However, Nanato woke up with a terrible cough, lucky to have been saved by his suit. At that moment, Metropolimon appeared behind them, ready to end Mirai with a white arrow. Mirai decided to become the motivational speaker he had prepared himself for, and began lecturing him on the purpose of life and death. And that leading by good example was the best way to rule, since Metropolimon was hoping to be crowned god. However, the lowlife told him that he was better off without any competitions, and wanted all the lottery slots to himself. Because what else would you expect from a low-budget Superman? As Nanato was finally able to fly again, he suggested attacking together, since the numbers were in their favor. But Metropolimon swiftly summoned his angel for moral support, unwilling to take the risk of entering an Isekai. 
so Nanato also summoned Nase and Barret to watch their backs. Natropolaman aimed his arrow at Nanato, taking him for the strongest man between the both of them, and hoping to cut the deficit by 70%, since Mirai was a useless weakling that could easily be tossed away like trash. Damn! In hopes of getting an advantage, he showed them his detonator, threatening to blow up the city to smithereens, so Nanato decided to offer himself up, unwilling to gamble with the lives of many. Metropolaman wanted a sacrificial lamb in exchange for sparing the city, and demanded for Nanato's abilities after ending him. However, Nanato believed that this was their perfect opportunity to eliminate fake Superman, so he told Mirai to shoot him with his arrow the instant he launched his own arrow at him, but the coward was too afraid to take aim. As Metro Man launched his arrow, he fired his own arrow at it, causing it to fly back to him. When he threatened to blow up everyone, Mirai suddenly flew at him, nearly impaling him, but he flew away just in time. Mirai charged again, relentless with his attacks, and screaming like a lunatic, but fake Superman dodged everything. He fired him his arrow, but he blocked it, and as he launched it again, Mirai continued dodging and blocking again. The villain charged at him, and they battled relentlessly, with either of them looking to destroy the other. Suddenly, Metro Man flew towards Nanato, and launched his arrow at him, but Mirai knocked it away. As they fought yet again, Nanato decided to attack Metropolaman from behind, and as he flew at him, he blasted him with relentless shots, causing a crack in his helmet. With their arch enemy gone, they decided to return, and swiftly crashed into the house. Nanato asked if Mirai lost his mind during the fight, but the depressed teenager hardly realized what he was doing. He wondered why the burden of defeating Metropolaman was on him, as he was too miserable to fight for anyone. So Nase told him that they're fighting to save the world, because if the crazy dude became god, the whole world would certainly burn. The following day at school, Saki's friend saw Mirai staring at her like a creepy stalker, and was going to confront him. But Saki stopped her from humiliating him, as she thought that he had too much to deal with already and didn't need to be made more miserable than he already was. That afternoon, after returning home, Nanato asked if Mirai could draw a sketch of Metropolaman, but the dude had already forgotten what he saw since he was always in a mode of depression, so Saki suggested taking a break. That night, while he was asleep, Saki invited him to her bed for a heart-to-heart. -heart. She looked extremely sad and asked the angels to take a hike. Revel wondered if they were going to begin some plot development and asked to see the process, but Nase thought he was a crazy weirdo and immediately pulled him away. As they laid in the bed, Saki told Mirai that she was looking to feel the warmth of his white liquid on her chest. <laughs> yeah, boy. But Mirai thought that she was demanding for too much. Having grown up together, she felt terrible for abandoning him after the loss of his parents, and was hoping to make up for it with a night of great passion before entering an isekai. She confessed to him that a few years ago, she had tried atoning for her sins and had ran after him to apologize for her wrongdoings, but had found him jumping off a building to hug the ground. Wrecked by her own guilt, she had run off and tried hugging the ocean, but luckily met her angel. However, even now, she was disturbed by the guilt of it and was hoping to die in his warm arms. Looking to grant her wish, Mirai led her outside, and with their hands bound, he flew off. In the night sky, he decided to let her go, but caught her hand, allowing her to take a moment to reconsider her decision. And as she began falling, she swiftly caught his hand, crying like a hopeless romantic, and telling him that she wished to leave, and to make babies with him. At those words, magical ropes swirled around their hands, binding them together in a lasting union. A few minutes later, they stood on a rooftop, and Saki began telling him that she dreamed of staying by his side forever, and having his arrow penetrate her chest. So he smiled at her, happy to be loved by the love of his life, and as he promised to stay with her forever, he began flying away with her. The next day, Nanato revealed that he was getting closer to discovering Metropolaman's identity. Hoping to join in the fight, Saki asked Barrett how she could get her own pair of wings, so Barrett told her the four methods. She could either kill a god candidate, impale him with a red arrow on his deathbed, be given wings by her angel or demand for the wings of a god candidate whose soul was being taken up to heaven. With all other options seeming impossible, Nanato suggested she stayed closer to him in the final moments of his cancerous life. However, she thought that she had other hopes than waiting on a dying man, and told him that she would rather take Metropolaman's wings. After all he was a sicko who never deserved to fly in the first place. Nanato was surprised by her words, and asked Mirai if their night of plot development released some great hormones in her body, 
but before he could answer, Revel told them that he would become a first rank angel so he could bless her with wings. However, he wasn't certain about how to increase his rank, so Barrett told him to either break a Guinness record in heaven, or become the smartest guy in the world. A few days later, they moved into a church, since their previous home was too tight to fit everyone. And before long, Saki found Revel trying to fill up his little brain with the celestial tomes, which were all the memories of creation, in hopes of increasing his rank immediately. When she left him, she revealed her stunning suit to Murai and Nanato, but suddenly, a small portal opened up before them, and a red arrow flew towards Saki, but Murai stood in the way, ready to take it in her place. However, Nanato took in the arrow, telling them that it belonged to him, and for a moment he wondered what could have gone wrong since the arrow was only meant to return after the carrier was dead. After realizing that his family may have been attacked, he swiftly flew into the sky with Murai and the angels. He tried calling his wife, but no one answered. And as they arrived at his home, they found a strange man waiting outside, so he told Murai to eliminate him as he crashed inside the house. He began rushing into the rooms, hoping to find his family, but they were nowhere in sight. As he saw his wife's damaged dress, he realized that his worst fear of losing his family was about to happen. Outside, Mirai aimed his red arrow at the strange man, who was merely playing with his sword like the creepy dude from Joker. As Mirai wondered if he was another god candidate, he decided to launch his arrow, but he flew away just in time, and after a moment, arrived in a park. His name was Hajime, and he was born as a poor and extremely ugly kid, before growing up into a much uglier and disgusting boy and was hated by everyone because of his filthy horrendous looks. Since he was the ugliest loser straight out of an Annie Climax intro, he could never talk to any girl, as none of them would ever look at his nasty sickening face. One evening, he discovered that his sister had isekai'd herself, since she couldn't bear to look at his revolting face anymore. However, an angel appeared before his eyes, introducing himself as Balta, a first-rank angel and told him to become a god candidate so he can make the world as ugly as his face. What did he say? But the stinky useless loser only wanted to meet girls, and asked for a red arrow so they could fall in love with him on the spot. The next day at school, the disgusting loser shot an arrow at his school crush, and soon began telling her that he wished to taste her beautiful honey. And as he held her hands, the horrendous loser asked for a kiss, and soon began plot development. However, when he looked into the mirror, he discovered that he was truly the ugliest human in the entire universe, who didn't even deserve free pussy, and immediately began freaking out. When he returned home, he began crying like a boy that lost his candy. However, a few days later, he saw Metropolemon on TV, and decided to pick him as his own John Cena. When Balta told him that Metropolemon was from a wealthy home, and had girls dreaming of getting in his bed, Hajim decided to have plastic surgery and become a follower of his new idol. After his surgery, Hajime began working out. He wondered if he could meet Metropolemon, but Mr. Idol would probably end him before he could say his name. A few days later, his face was unveiled, and as he walked through the street a few minutes later, everyone began staring at him. When he looked into the mirror, he saw a sweet young girl, and immediately flew in her way. All his life, he's dreamt of this beautiful moment where he could look at a girl, and ask for her name. But he blew it like a f***ing moron, making the poor girl run off for her dear life. At his home, the loser began crying again, realizing that all his surgeries would never make him a real top G, because he was nothing but a useless bummer. However, he soon saw Mirai and Metro Man's battle scene on TV, and thought it was unfair that his hero wasn't allowed to destroy the world, so he decided to declare himself the new Justice Kid. When Balta told him that Metropolemon would make the worst god leader, Justice Kid told him to f*** off. The only thing that would make this sucker happy was to see the world burn. So after a few days, he tried scheduling for another plastic surgery so he could look like his hero. But the doctor told him to cool off, as he was beginning to look like a walking doll. After returning home, Hajime discovered that Metropolemon was in high school, and decided to search through every high school in the city. A few days later, a girl told Mr. Idol during class that an addict worshipper, who practically burns candles in his name, was looking to meet him. However, as she left, Metro Man shot her with a red arrow, but realized that she already had a master, so he killed her with a white arrow to keep his secret safe. A few minutes later, a dude walked into an empty room, replacing Mr. Idol, and asking who Hajime was. He called himself his biggest fanatic, who was too afraid to appear in person, but desired to serve him. To determine his worth, Metropolemon decided to give him a test, which was abducting Nanato's family. 
Now having done so, he asked if he was allowed to penetrate Nanato's wife with a love arrow, but Metropolimon called him the most useless ugly creep in the world. You're a victim! Mm. Inside the church, Nanato received a call from Mr. Idol, who told him about his family's whereabouts, so they all flew out to meet him. With Saki all by herself, she soon began to feel sad and useless. Determined to help her, Revel returned to the room and began filling up his head with the tomes. At the park, Nanato screamed for his family and found Hajime standing on a mirror house where his family were being kept. He banged on the glass and hurried inside without any thought. Hajime was surprised that his plan actually worked and revealed that no one could come out of it. However, when he heard Nanato's wife tell him that she loved him, he began losing his mind. Having grown up without any affection, Hajime thought that love was a cooked up word and that no one could actually love someone else. Suddenly, Murai appeared above him, aiming at him with a white arrow, but he called him a spineless chicken that could not annihilate anyone. He tried launching a red arrow towards Nanato's wife, but Murai fired at him as he narrowly dodged. Inside the box, Nanato began shooting at the glass, hoping to break it, but it merely scratched the surface. Outside, Hajime appeared before Mirai with his angel, making him realize that he was also a god candidate, but Metropolimon also appeared and aimed at him. At the sight of Metro Man, Hajime began losing his shit and told him this was the happiest day of his wretched life, but Mr. Idol couldn't care less and aimed his arrow at Nanato, looking to kill him in that moment. However, Mirai was determined to save him and began moving towards the box. As he met Nanato, he suggested flying around the glass so Metropolimon couldn't take aim at them, as it was the only way to protect his family, so he accepted to fly around. Outside, Metro Man told Hajime that they would end the both of them when they were exhausted. But Hajime was wondering why Mirai went into the box and was risking his own life for Nanato's family when he could have flown off and saved himself. When Metro Man told him that they love one another, he began freaking out again. Inside the box, Mirai told Nanato that he has no plans for escaping. While outside, he had had very little time to come up with a plan, and merely followed the first thought he had. For the rest of that evening, Hajime waited outside the glass, playing with his sword like the dude from Samurai Jack. A few minutes later, Mirai told Nanato that he knew of a way to escape the box, however, he was merely hoping to make Hajime curious enough to open it. After a moment, they exploded in a bright light, pretending to have escaped. The dumbass actually believed that they had vanished and suggested looking inside the box, but Metro Man threatened to rip his head off. When it was nighttime, Hajime's curiosity began to grow again since the box had been silent all day, and he thought of having a peek, but Mr. Idol asked him if he would like to spend Thanksgiving without his eyes. By morning, Hajime realized that their angels had vanished, but Metro Man told him that they were merely playing along with the script. In a far-off tower, Nase and Barrett hoped that Hajime would believe their trick and would free Nanato and his family. At the same time, Hajime began looking through the glass, asking if he could give them some food, but Metropolimon threatened to destroy him. Meanwhile in the church, Revel's head was about to blow up from all his studies. When he tried putting another tome through his head, it rolled out, so he hurried to catch it. As he picked it up, he discovered Saki waiting outside, looking useless and depressed. She told him that she felt like the world's most useless superhero, and was merely a dead weight for everyone. I'm here to tell you right now, we don't care. Let me tell, right, let me tell you, <laughs> we don't care. Jerry However, she wished to offer some moral support and suggested walking to the park, but Revel told her that she would be in danger if Metropolimon discovered that she was also a god candidate. At that moment, he began to cry, feeling sad for her, but his tears transformed into bubbles, and as a gold light shone around him, God appeared before him, telling him that his tears had created a world record in heaven, and due to this, he was being promoted to a first-rank angel and was named the Angel of Emotion. A new magical circle formed around his head, but immediately he threw it on Saki, and she grew large wings in that instant, bringing her desire to life. A few minutes later, they appeared at the tower and the angels applauded Revel for his promotion. After Balto encouraged Saki to rescue her friends from the box, she decided to aim at Hajime, and immediately fired him a red arrow at him, causing him to love her in that instant and as she flew towards him, he began climaxing. Meanwhile in the box, Nanato and Mirai were exhausted from flying all day and night and were hoping for a miracle. Nanato was about giving up, but he remembered that his wife had warned him never to give up on his family, so he became determined again. Outside, Hajime continued climaxing like he was in some crazy orgy. When Metropolimon asked him why he was acting like a creepy weirdo, 
He told him that he had wet his pants and needed to clean himself up, so he flew off. However, he appeared before Saki, asking if she would like to see him jump out of a plane without his wings or a parachute. But she thought that he would look like a bag full of bones, and told him to free her friends instead. Moved by her words, he immediately flew off like every other simp, and crashed his sword onto the glass. He told Metro Man that he was going to free the family, and began hammering his sword on it. Inside, Mirai and Nanato continued flying around. When they heard the noise outside, they thought it was Metropolitan trying to lure them to the glass. However, Revel revealed that they were trying to rescue them, and informed them that Saki had gotten her own wings. As Hajime continued smacking the glass, Metropolitan threatened to annihilate him. But the simp was lost in love, and would not stop. He said that he finally understood why teenagers do crazy things for love, and since no one ever cared enough to show him real affection, he wouldn't pass up the opportunity of being with the girl of his dreams. And with that, he impaled the glass with a final stab. Immediately, Metropolitan began to leave, looking to stop him before Mirai and Nanato were freed. As he flew into the sky, three numbskulls flew beside him for support, and as Hajime tried breaking the glass, they crashed into the park. Metropolitan threatened to end Saki, since she was greatly outnumbered, but Hajime flew before him, determined to protect the love of his life. Meanwhile inside the box, Nanato spotted the crack in the glass and began firing at it as they broke outside. Immediately, the sword spun into Hajime's hand. After the group reunited, Nanato decided to face off with Metro Man for the final time. However, Metropolitan wanted a fair fight, so he told him to take his family to a safe place before their showdown. Moments later, Saki brought Nanato's wife to the church, but as she was about to leave, the woman wondered why they were fighting, so she told her that they were trying to save the world from the greatest disaster after World War II. Soon, Saki returned to the park and was ready to leave with Nanato's daughter, so Nanato gave her one final hug before Saki flew away. Since Metropolitan was wearing a thick protective suit, he figured that he couldn't be annihilated by Nanato or Hajime's weapons. His greatest threat was Mirai, who had a white arrow that could end him in an instant. However, Mirai wasn't certain that he could eliminate him, as he never considered execution to be an option. So to aid in their decisions, his friends decided to control each other. And as they drew closer, ready to impale one another with a red arrow, Nanato apologized for getting them involved in the battle. And just then, they planted the arrow into themselves, making it impossible for Metro Man to control any of them. As they were set for battle, Metropolitan announced that he was going to step aside until all his followers were defeated. Immediately, Ruki stepped up as the first challenger, drawing his guns and looking to blast everyone away. Hajime took up the challenge and flew at him, but immediately, the psychopath began firing at him, riddling the park with bullets and explosion, as he destroyed everything in his sight. However, Hajime moved through all the bullets and was unscathed, so the menace launched a bazooka at him, destroying the tower before him. Suddenly, the ugly mug tried slashing him from behind, but he flew away. However, his wings were caught by Mirai and Nanato, who began pulling him towards the ground, allowing Hajime to slash him. As he hit the ground, he discovered that his arm was slashed off and that no one cared for his sorry ass, so he immediately flew away. Sika began to feel sick, but Mirai encouraged her to get her shit together. Soon, a deranged lunatic came forward. She was Fayuko, and as she began revealing her plot, she showed them her special virus, which she created to destroy the world. As a quick exhibition, she decided to test a mice before their eyes, and release the virus into its bottle. When the poor thing started deteriorating, the psychopath began screaming and climaxing, and threatened to unleash this evil on the world if they wouldn't offer themselves up as a lab rat. Since Mirai was the bigger threat, Metropolitan demanded that he first take the shot. But Mirai could not understand why Metro Man was looking to eliminate the world in the first place. After all he was desiring to rule over everything. As Mirai began moving towards the menace, she commanded Nanato and Hajime to throw down their weapons. When he got closer, Saki screamed for him to return, afraid of losing him. But he continued walking. He wondered if sacrificing himself would make the world safer for everyone. But knew Metropolitan was a scumbag, and would continue hurting people for his own pleasure. As Fayuko pierced him with a syringe, he held her hand and drew his wings, so she released the virus from her jar, ready to destroy the world. However, Mirai impaled it with his white arrow, and killed the virus. Immediately, Nanato screamed at him to end her in that instant. But Mirai merely stood there, holding her hand. Nanato told him that Fayuko would not repent if he let her get away, but would continue threatening the world with the virus. 
However, he could not bring himself to annihilate her. So Fayuko began teasing him, saying that she had an entire warehouse full of the virus and was going to destroy the whole world. But Murai dreaded the thought of ending someone. Suddenly, Nanato crashed to the ground from exhaustion. His sickness was beginning to eat deep into his body, and he was merely fighting to stay conscious. However, he decided to grab a gun, determined to see Metropolem and die before him, and aimed it at Fayuko. Utilizing the distraction, Metro Man summoned a red and white arrow, looking to eliminate Murai. But he aimed his own arrow at the girl, hoping to use her as a shield from Metro Man's arrows. As Metropolem and fired his arrow, Fayuko drew her wings and launched her syringes at Murai in a fatal attack. Saki suddenly flew in his way, looking to die in his place, but the arrows rolled away from her, as they were meant to kill Murai instead. With the syringes about to stick in her, Hajime grabbed his sword and slashed them off, but as he missed the last one, he put his arm in the way. In that moment, the virus went inside of him, and his skin began deteriorating. However, Fayuka was already impaled with his sword and immediately passed out. Hajime told Saki that he lived the most useless and filthy life that any human should ever have, but in his last moments, he was happy to have met her and to understand the true meaning of love. As he melted off, his wings dissolved to old sacks, and only a red arrow remained in his place. While Saki was crying, two angels flew down from heaven, so Balta gave Saki Hajime's magical rings and returned her arrow to her. Metropolem and told Mirai that he was responsible for Hajime's death, seeing as he failed to end Fayuko when he had his chance. But Mirai would not agree to this, and accused him of trying to kill everyone because of his stupid ambitions. He had always hoped to see everyone leave forever, and due to this, would never annihilate anyone. Nanato coughed up blood, and as he passed out, Metro Man fired him an arrow, but Murai narrowly saved him. He was going to take him to a hospital for treatment, but the man was determined to see Metropolem and get annihilated and demanded to stay. So Murai allowed Saki to return him to the ground. Nanato asked if Metro Man's last follower was willing to die for him, but the boy immediately flew away. Having no other support, Metro Man decided to face off with Murai, and began teasing him that he was useless, and couldn't even beat a cockroach. However, Murai confessed that he had no intentions of ending him, but would rather stick him with a red arrow, and make him his own janitor, before sealing him away forever like a mummy. Metropolem and said that ending him would be a kinder thing to do, but Murai had no intentions of soiling his hands with his disgusting and perverted blood. For their final battle, Metropolem and suggested that they create some rules, so Murai agreed with him, and told him that they could only shoot arrows at each other one at a time, until one of them was impaled. Soon, they flew to the ground, ready for their showdown. Metropolem and decided to flick a coin, telling him that whoever won the coin toss would take the first shot. But as he flicked the coin, he launched an arrow that was narrowly blocked and called it a warm-up. As they walked closer, Mirai fired an arrow, but it got blocked, leaving him in shock, as he had thought that he alone could parry the arrows. Metropolem and called himself the greatest man alive, and that he was the best candidate for the position of God. A few years ago, he had a sister named Rhea, whom he loved dearly, and gave her all the things money can buy. Since they had everything they ever wanted, he was determined to keep her all to himself, and would not let her have any friends. However, on one evening, she told him about a boy she met, and was beginning to like. But Metropolem and didn't want her to be with anyone else, so he threatened to lock her up in a cell tower like Fiona. Afraid for herself, she tried running away, but he caught her, and screamed at her. However, the girl broke from his grip, and began trying to hug the ground. He immediately hurried to her, and as he raised her, she looked fine for a moment, but passed out. The deranged dude realized that she needed treatment immediately, but was too psychotic to let her out of his sight, and decided to watch her die. The following night, after her burial, he visited a lab where she was being kept in ice like a f fish. He intended to preserve her like a trophy, and hoped that she would become Iceman in a hundred years or so. As he broke down in fake tears, he took out a knife, but an angel appeared behind him, and told him that he can rewaken her by becoming God, and could transform her into an angel. Those words became his motivation, and they inspired him to slay every god candidate that existed, the same way he was looking to end Murai. As he summoned his arrow, he fired at Murai, but he blocked it. In the city, everyone began watching them on giant screens. With Murai and Metropolem and only a few meters apart, Murai began wondering if he was considering a new plan to attack with. But the dude denied it, and told him that he was only interested in beating his ass fairly, and becoming god. It had been his obsession for a long time, 
Even though he doubted that a god really existed and thought that the angels were merely supernatural creatures, but he had nothing to lose by giving it a shot. When Saki asked him why he was so horrible and cruel, he accused her of trying to distract him and told her to screw herself. Immediately, Mirai fired an arrow at him, but he managed to block it again. Saki told him that she had no desire to become god, but was merely curious to know how he would rule the world if he became one. However, he snorted her question and fired at Mirai again, but got blocked again. He began telling them that he was born to dominate the entire world, and that if he became god he would destroy everyone who earned below the average salary and would wipe out all non-taxpayers and everyone waiting on unemployment benefits. He thought that brokies do not deserve bread and were better off left to starve, while the rich got richer. He didn't want ugly losers like Hajime in his world, but only wanted wealthy men like Elon Musk and Bill Gates. And as for the broke pretty girls, he thought they were better off waiting tables. With a few inches apart from each other, Mirai prepared to take what may be his final shot. Since his red arrow could not kill anyone, he realized that Metro Man could end him in an instant with his arrow, yet he couldn't fly away to avoid it, as that would be against the rules of their engagement. However, as they watched one another, waiting to see who would make the first attempt, Mirai realized that this Metropolitan may not be the real one, so Metro Man decided to reveal his face. As soon as Mirai saw him, his confidence grew, and he was convinced that he could defeat him. Meanwhile in the city, while the people continued watching the battle on the screens, a random dude began screaming in support of Metropolitan. At the same time, Mirai began charging towards Metro Man, but as he fired his arrow, Mirai blocked it and lunged at him. However, the arrow got stuck and would not impale him, allowing Mirai to realize that he had already had an arrow inside of him. At that moment, a new arrow began growing in his hand, but Mirai pushed him back, causing the arrow to launch away. And as he drew his wings, he held his hand and wrapped the wings around him. Metropolitan realized that his end could be near, and as he panicked, he drew a blade and began stabbing Mirai with it. But luckily, his suit protected him, and he would not release his hand. Metro Man told his angel to move his magical rings to his other hand, but Meza would not do so. When he tried stabbing Mirai again, Saki held his second hand, and they both restrained him to a wall. Desperate to get free, he slashed Saki's helmet off and began screaming like a nutcase as he drew his wings and tried flying away. But in a final effort, Mirai and Saki summoned magical ropes that bound his hands in that instant. With their archenemy finally restrained, Nanato stepped up, ready to end him, and started staggering closer, weak and dizzy from his illness. Mirai tried talking him out of it, and told him to abandon his desire to annihilate him. But Nanato had his mind made up, and as he fell to the ground, remembering his wife and daughter, he realized that ending fake Superman was the only thing that would bring peace into his soul. While he was taking aim, Metro Man discovered that the end was coming for him, and began telling them that he would repent from all his sins, and would sit in jail for as long as they wanted. However, no amount of promises would change his fate. Nanato believed that ending him was his destiny, and as he remembered his family again, he began firing at Metropolitan. As the bullets flew closer, he tried flying away, but was trapped and couldn't free his hands. Realizing his life was about to end, he began screaming, saying that he didn't want to become God anymore, and would offer all his wealth to charity. But the bullets penetrated his suit. Just then, a red arrow and several magical rings flew into the sky. But as Mirai tried following them, he discovered that Nanato had passed out. Meza began pulling Metropolitan's soul and began to wonder why all his wealth could not rewaken him. Balta understood the irony of her question and told her that no amount of wealth could guarantee long life for a human, as they were never meant to have everything. In the hospital, the doctor told Nanato's wife that he would never wake up again, as he was in the most fatal stage of his illness. As she began to cry, she took out his cigarette and put it in his mouth, since he would never stop smoking when he was alive. However, the cigarette fell off, and in that instant, Barrett appeared above, and pulled his soul from his body. Since Nanato wanted Saki to take his wings, Barrett decided to give her his magical rings, and vanished from before them. Immediately, Mirai's arrow dispelled, which Nanato had put inside of him, and in that moment, he knew that no miracle would rewaken his friend. That night, Saki suggested they return home, but Mirai was feeling guilty for allowing Metropolitan to be annihilated, and blamed himself for not stopping it from happening. When Saki told him that they made the right decision, he said that she was supporting him because of his arrow that was inside of her, but she told him that she has always been in love with him, and was willing to do anything for him even without his arrow in her heart. After a moment, Mirai decided to tell her that Metropolitan had been shot with an arrow before their fight, 
and that after his death, the arrow and magical circles flew off to whomever was controlling him. Meanwhile, across the city, Metropolemon's last follower, Yuido, thanked Balta for helping him to lure Metropolemon to his annihilation. He had shot him the red arrow, and was happy to have all his powers. At the same time, Mirai began to wonder how many more enemies they needed to defeat, but he feared that another powerful enemy would soon emerge. When Saki brought him dinner a few minutes later, she found him lying on the floor asleep, and decided to cover him up so he wouldn't feel cold. The next morning, she invited him for breakfast, and as he ate, he told her that it's the best meal he's had since he lost his family. Meanwhile, Nase and Revel were having a meeting with the other angels, as they wondered if any of the remaining god candidates were fitting to become god. When the Angel of Truth, Yaisley, said that they were hopeless, Penema, who was the Angel of Games, promised to provide a worthy candidate before their 800 days elapsed. At the church, while Mirai and Saki were eating, Revel hurried to them, and told them about a new god candidate that was revealing himself to the people. It was Yuido, and as he took off his mask for everyone to see, he began rising into the air. When the reporter asked how he got his powers, he decided to tell everyone the story. Since God was tired of ruling the world, he had sent 13 angels to Earth so they could find him a replacement. As he revealed a drawing of his angel, he said that only the chosen candidates had the ability to see them. Several months ago, he was a nobody in school and lived a very sad and lonely life. When he tried eating too much candy, an angel appeared to him and gave him the red arrow and the ability to fly. So when he returned to school the following day, he put arrows in his classmates and made them fall in love with him and give him their toys. However, one day, he saw Metropolemon threatening to annihilate every god candidate in the world and became afraid for himself. So he decided to shoot him an arrow and made him fight with Mirai till the death. With six god candidates left, he was hoping to meet the rest of them and revealed that he was hoping to see Mirai become the new god. Since he didn't know his real identity, he wanted everyone to look for him and to reveal who he was so he can be voted in as God. But Mirai and his friends thought that it was a trap to eliminate them. When Saki asked if Mirai could be crowned God through the support of other God candidates, Revel revealed that it was a possibility. However, they needed to support him without being influenced by a red arrow. In the city, three policemen snuck onto the rooftop and launched an net at Yuido, but he flew away, leaving everyone staring in shock. A few days later, Saki suggested they run away, since half the world was looking for them. She thought that they were better off living in some remote island and eating coconuts for breakfast. And in a few years, they could start having babies and watching late-night television. Mirai had always imagined waking up on her beautiful cherries, but thought that running away would be a cowardly thing to do, so he suggested that they pretend to be normal people. Several weeks later, they returned to school, pretending not to know each other. But while Mirai was returning home, a strange man pulled up before him and demanded to speak with him. With Murai looking too freaked out to move, the man showed him his badge, but immediately, Murai drew his wings and aimed his arrow at him. However, the man told him that he came on a peacekeeping mission and was as harmless as a dove. Although the entire world was looking for him, he considered him too valuable to be exposed. Suddenly, he began wondering if Murai was holding a red or white arrow, since he couldn't actually see it. With Murai still looking freaked out, he told him that another agent was trying to meet Saki at the same moment. Immediately, Mirai ran towards Saki and saw her with a random lady, whom she had just impaled with a red arrow. The man hurried to her, but since he could not see the arrow, he decided to ask for her favorite color. However, the lady could only remember Saki's name, as she was totally in love. Fascinated by his discovery, the man told them that the lady was his wife and that they have been married for a decade. And although he's always known about the abilities of the red and white arrows, it seemed like a movie as he watched it play out before his eyes. He introduced himself as Hoshi, and told them that they were the world's most wanted teenagers because of their abilities, as every country in the world was looking to make them the most powerful assassins alive. At those words, Murai and Saki drew their wings and were ready to fly away, but he swore on his mother's grave that he was telling the truth. Moments later in his car, he told them that the remaining god candidates were being hunted all across the city, and needed their help in finding them, as they were soon to be brainwashed into modern-day Terminators. At these words, Mirai began panicking, but swore never to get caught. Inside the apartment, Hoshi told his wife, Yumiki, that they were being summoned to the headquarters, but she would rather stay with the new love of her life. Saki wished to avoid an awkward situation, so she told her to go with him. However, before leaving, she handed them new phones to keep their whereabouts hidden. 
When they were gone, Mirai told Saki that Hoshi was acting like a weirdo and may have intentionally allowed his wife to get impaled with an arrow so he could win over their trusts. But she thought he was becoming paranoid and rather believed that they genuinely cared about them. When they returned that night, Mirai declared his support for them. But after a moment, Hoshi began asking Saki to give his wife her own pair of wings. Since she could only have them for a few weeks, he thought that it was best for her to utilize her gift and to begin seeing angels herself. After a little hesitation, Saki threw her a magical ring, and immediately, a pair of wings burst from her, as she saw the angels, and began rising up in the air. After a moment, Hoshi revealed his findings to them, and told them that several people were beginning to declare themselves as god candidates, and were campaigning for the state's assembly. The following night, Mirai decided to appear before a man, who was pretending to be another god candidate, but as he began to scream, Mirai realized that the dude was fake. The next day, as they looked for a new lead, Saki decided to give Yumiki another magical ring, so she could summon her own red arrows. After a few days, Mirai appeared before a boy, and aimed his arrow at him. His name was Minamikawa. When he began freaking out, Mirai asked why he had not flown away, like every other god candidate would have, so he told them that he had no wings. Taking him for a low-ranking candidate, Mirai decided to shoot him with an arrow. In a nearby house, a young boy was confessing to his brother that he ended their parents by firing a red arrow at them, and commanded them to enter Nirvana. Hearing these words, his brother became horrified and asked to die like their parents. So the boy summoned his arrow, but as he launched it towards him, it got blocked as Mirai appeared before his eyes. Before long, the boy's angel, Agero, appeared behind him for support. After realizing that Minamikawa was the only one without an angel, Mirai decided to ask him if his horrendous face had scared his angel off. Yo, that one there was a violation, personally I wouldn't have been. But the dude never had an angel, so he began confessing that he was the biggest loser in the world, and could not afford an angel if they were sold for a dollar. He had lied about being a god candidate because he was afraid of getting annihilated. Hearing these words, the boy introduced himself as Shuji and told Mirai to end him, since he was a depressed and lonely orphan. As he summoned a red arrow, he called it a wishing arrow, since he could make anyone eliminate themselves whenever they were feeling sad and miserable. Several months ago, while in the hospital, he had decided to put his grandfather out of his misery, and as he impaled him with an arrow, he commanded him to this act made him realize that he could become a demigod. So when his mother abandoned their family and ran off with a filthy lowlife, he decided to vote himself judge and executioner. With his father unable to move on, he commanded him to count all the fish in the river until he drowned. And after he died, he decided to end his mother too, and made her beg for forgiveness like a miserable bitch. When her lowlife lover showed up, hoping to die by her side, Shuji decided to grant his wish, since he was the self-proclaimed god of death. However, the vain loser immediately ate his words and asked for his life to be spared. Shuji discovered that everyone who desired to die merely needed a helping hand in the form of his beautiful death arrows, and that had made him to take up the position of the death-granting lord of their city. When Mirai told him that he could go to jail for helping someone meet the Buddha, the boy looked at them in shock and promised to repent from his ways. However, for the final time, he wished to end his brother, so he aimed at him. But Mirai stood in his way. Since life was an endless cycle of pain and misery, Shuji believed that everyone had the choice to leave or die. However, Mirai would not agree with him, as he was convinced that life was worth living for, even through all the pain and suffering. With Shuji refusing to accept this, Minamikawa decided to get involved, and began telling him that every human was born for a divine purpose, and that the moment they ended themselves, they would be leaving a vacuum in the world forever. Moved by these words, Shuji decided to spare his brother, but vowed to end himself at any moment. Revel was hoping to change his mind, so he asked him to stick around until a new god was crowned, but the boy didn't give a shit about it. Mirai told him that the entire world were looking for the god candidates, and that it was only a matter of time before he was found. So after a moment, the boy agreed to go with them. In the apartment, Mirai introduced them all to each other, but as Shuji saw Yumika's huge cannons, he took off to the corner. After a few hours, his sadness grew again, and he told everyone that he was really considering hugging the ground. He saw human life as a total and futile waste that depended only on selfish desires, the same way he was born into the world without any real affection. Since his mother decided to abandon him like he was worth nothing, he could only see the world as trash, and everyone as a f***ing garbage truck. However, Hoshi thought that he was being too hard on himself, and told him that there were good people who really care about their loved ones, and hoped that he would stay alive long enough to know who will become the new god. 
The following day, Mirai and Saki appeared in the city, and as they began telling everyone that the god candidates were as harmless as a butterfly, Yuido appeared before them. He called himself Mirai's biggest fan, but wondered if Mirai was a clone. Hoping to discover the truth, he decided to fire an arrow at him, but Mirai blocked it. With that settled, Mirai suggested speaking in private, so they vanished from the city. In outer space, Mirai told Yuido that they were looking to choose a new god and would like to keep him close to their group, so the boy accepted to join them. Meanwhile, in a faraway state house, a young lady, Yuri, who was the fifth god candidate, was informed by the remaining angels about the meeting to choose the next god. Since she was being held by secret agents, she decided to escape and pretended to pass out on the floor. As three security walked into the room to have a look at her, she launched her arrows right into them and commanded them to help her escape. As they arrived in a new room, one of the men shot at the window, allowing the girl to burst outside and take off. The security began running after her, but as they forced her to the ground, they realized that it was one of the men who was disguised as her. At the same time, Yuri came across Yuido, Mirai and Saki. In hopes of gaining her trust, Yuido decided to give her a magical ring, allowing her to grow wings in that instant and rise into the air. While flying, Yuido told Yuri that no one trusted him because of his ability to eliminate everyone with a white arrow, and due to this, he would not be following them to the apartment, as he immediately flew away. In the morning, Hoshi suggested they vote for a new god. With everyone looking to choose Murai, Shuji decided to ask his angel what trophy Murai would be given if crowned as god. Ogero told them that god would have the power to annihilate every one of them, and would have unlimited red and white arrows to either make everyday Christmas, or a horror show. God could kill anyone he wanted, and he could turn their world to an isekai if he wished. After all, earth and humanity are fickle. Additionally, whoever that became God would cease to be human, and due to this, could not remain on earth. At these words, everyone became reluctant, since apparently, they wished to continue enjoying the good life on earth. With everyone else unwilling to become God, Shuji decided to take up the position. He declared that he would make the world equal and just, and would offer VIP seats to everyone who hugs the ground. But Mirai called it the worst idea in the whole universe, and thought that it would only lead the world into chaos. Through the phone, Yuido suggested that they take a vote, so both of the girls voted for Mr. Sad Face. However, just when they thought everything was done, Ogero told them that they needed the support of the last candidate, but he was being aided by the Angel of Destruction, who had a reputation for igniting wars in heaven. The following day, the group appeared in the city, and before long, the Angel of Destruction, Mooney, began approaching them. She told them that they needed to make their confessions before having a meeting with the final candidate, and at that moment, several helicopters flew towards them and prepared to fire at them. However, the group vanished, and as they appeared in another part of the city, they discovered that the helicopters were retreating. Norai announced that they wished to declare their intentions for Earth if they became God. And just as he was done, Shuji decided to speak first, and began saying that it was his dream to see humans pass on like leaves, and would be more than happy to watch people hug the ground on their own terms. The next person was Yuri, who said that her own desire was to watch robots take over the earth, and to live on a yacht for the rest of her life. Yuido confessed that he was looking to destroy every school in the entire world, so that teenagers would never have to worry about homework anymore. Saki, however, was merely hoping to see everyone smile like the f***ing Joker. When it was Murai's turn, he declared that he would do nothing, and would rather leave the world the same way it was. At the same time across the city, the final man was watching them all on TV. His name was Yonda, and he was a mad scientist. As he approached the window, he summoned his angel, and vanished. Immediately, he appeared before the group, and after a moment, he began telling them that they were all being tricked by the angels, and that God was a fake. Since nothing else made sense to him, he was convinced that God was another angel, who lived off of humanity's fate, and would vanish the instant everyone stopped worshipping him. So in a desperate attempt to save himself, he had forced his angels to trick them into believing that he would bestow upon them the power to rule Earth. However, Mr. Scientist was convinced that it was merely another means of deceiving Earth into believing he exists, and that the world didn't need him anymore, since tech was fast taking over. Saki confessed that she wasn't a total believer either, however, she thought that it was important for humans to worship what they believe in. As Shuji decided to support Yonda, the rest of the group became confused and wondered who would offer themselves up to the angels. So Yonda advised that they gave back their dude. abilities and return to being regular people. Shuji told them that the world would be a better place if they weren't afraid of dying and decided that they were better off not believing in anything. 
However, Mirai would not accept this, so he declared that he would become God. Suddenly, Yuido vanished to a building and found a few men aiming a gun at each one of them. He wondered if they were making a movie and decided to aim his arrow at them in imitation. Mirai screamed for him to return to the group, but the boy would not listen. In that instant, a gun went off and Yuido began falling from a gun wound. As a bullet was fired at the group, they dispersed and Mirai began flying towards Yuido, but Yonda flew away with him. Before long, more bullets flew at them, but they vanished and left the city. At the same time, Yonda impaled Yuido with an arrow and soon claimed all his magical rings for himself. Later that day, Yonda told the group that Yuido had passed away and suggested they found a place to hide. But when they were inside a cryptic house, Yonda impaled Shuji with an arrow, looking to control him and make him his new puppet. In the apartment, Yuri confessed that she had lived a very lonely life and that having her abilities was the best thing that happened to her. She was hoping never to lose them and asked Mirai never to take it from her if he becomes god, so he agreed to it. A few days later, Hoshi and Yumiki brought them to an abandoned station where they could hide until they were safe. Mirai suggested that they try to convince Yona to support them, but Yuri thought that it would be too dangerous. At that moment, Saki began to look sad as she realized that they may all be annihilated. The following day, the arrow in Yumiki vanished, so Mirai decided to summon another arrow for Hoshi, looking to keep the couple close to them. That afternoon, they watched the president on TV as he admitted that God was truly sick, and that the God candidates were the only people who could save the world from annihilation. He intended to stay out of their business and guaranteed that they would not be attacked any longer, but would be granted their own space to decide who would become the next God. Mr. Ugly Stein was next, and he told everyone that he was looking to see an Earth without God, and intended to eliminate every God candidate, so that his vision for Earth would play out before his eyes. Mirai wondered what would happen if they were all dead, so Revel told him that God would vanish forever. The next day, Mirai revealed to Saki and Yuri that only a few people in the world still believed that God existed. He was afraid that becoming God would not convince the people to believe in him, and that after a few years as God, he may also begin to vanish. Saki asked him if he was getting reluctant to become God, but Mirai had no answer for her. Later that night, as they sat on a rooftop, looking at the beautiful night sky, Saki told Mirai that she loved him with all of her heart and was hoping to stay with him forever. So he smiled and held her hand as they watched the sunrise together. That afternoon, the group appeared at an empty stadium to meet Professor Creep You Out. He told them that his intention was to stop any of them from becoming God, including himself. Since none of them was meant to remain alive, he intended to eliminate every last one of them at the same time, as that was the only way to keep them from becoming God. Having done a bit of experiment himself, he realized that it was possible to impale each other's hearts at an instant. Yuri wondered why hugging the ground was their better option, so he told her that humans alone should be allowed to rule the earth. Since humans were never meant to exist forever, he thought that they were better off putting their minds into robots and creating synthetic babies. However, Mirai told him that he was determined to become god and to save the few humans who matter to him. Hoping to convince him, Yonda asked to speak with Mirai alone. After the others flew away, Yonda told him that no human could truly be happy, as happiness was merely determined by the things everyone could see, and that even he could never save the world from evil if he became God. Mirai thought that Yonda's books were making him lose his mind, and lose touch with reality, so he told him that his mind would not be changed. Yonda said that ending him was his only hope to become God, so Mirai immediately aimed his white arrow at him. When the professor said that he could not end him, Mirai fired at him, but he vanished. Mirai asked why Professor Crazy was looking to replace humanity with robots, so Yonda told him that humans were destined to vanish in a few years, and that he was merely hoping to see it happen in half the time. Realizing that this crazy genius could not be convinced, Mirai decided to end him, but Yonda told him that Saki and the rest of his friends had been caught, and were soon to be annihilated. He wanted Mirai to reconsider his decision, and to decide if he would rather save his future baby mama, or still become God. As the timer began counting down, Mirai chose the love of his life. Meanwhile in the city, everyone was watching the both of them on giant screens. When Yonda asked why Mirai was choosing his girl over becoming God, Mirai told him that he loved her with all of his heart and soul. However, the professor was convinced that love was the biggest crypto scam, and was merely inspired by raging hormones. But Mirai believed that he must have had a useless lonely and disgusting life. Determined to end him, Yonda threatened to eliminate Saki if he wouldn't offer himself up for termination. As his timer began counting down, Mirai decided to accept. 
However, Nasse appeared before him, warning him that the professor was trying to trick him into surrendering himself. But he would not listen to her, as memories of Saki were in his mind. At that instant, Yonda fired his arrow towards him. But Nasse began pulling him away, and flew high to the sky, telling him that his life was important to her. However, in that moment, she paused, and he started falling down. A strange bubble covered her, and her body began to peel. As Hoshi managed to catch Mirai, they both watched her inside the mysterious bubble. Nase told Mirai that she was getting demoted to second rank, and could only power him with either wings or red arrows. After a quick thought, Mirai chose his red arrows, and immediately, his magical rings returned to her, and the strange bubble broke to pieces. Yonda told Hoshi to bring Mirai to him, but Hoshi knew that he only wanted to end him, since he had lost his ability to fly. Meanwhile, Saki, Yuri and Yumiki were tied up. Saki confessed that she wishes to remain alive, and to have a family with Mirai, the same way he was hoping to stay alive for her. Her dream was to do his laundry, and to make him breakfast, while staying up all night to develop beautiful plot with him. At those words, Shuji became confused, as he could only terminate people who were looking to pass on. At the same time, Nase suggested that Mirai should run off without Saki, but he told her that Saki was his battery, and that without her he would power down. She told him that she came into his life to make him happy, but Mirai believed that he could never be happy without Saki by his side. After returning to the ground, Yonda launched another arrow towards Mirai, but right before impaling him, Saki saved him. Before long, the group gathered together, and Shuji explained to Yonda that he could only end people who have a desire to meet their maker. Yonda thought that he was a weakling, but when Yonda asked him to return his white arrow, Yuri appeared behind him and launched it towards him. Luckily, Nase rescued him from meeting his doom. She said that her destiny was to make Mirai happy, so she decided to save Yonda since she knew Mirai had no true desire to end him. Immediately, another bubble covered her up, but this time, her body began to heal, and as a bright light exploded, she returned to her special rank. Meanwhile in the city, everyone continued watching them on the screens. Yuri told Yonda that after Shuji freed them, she had tricked him by suggesting that she held the white arrow, so everyone would feel a lot safer. Yonda began to look sad, and told them that he had led himself into believing all the right things were wrong. However, he would never believe that God was real. As he began walking away, Mirai told him that he didn't have to believe in any god, but could simply decide to be a good or a bad person. A few months ago, he thought of hugging the ground, as he could only feel pain and misery, but now he was happy to be alive, and was excited to see Saki in his bed every morning. Yonda told them that his whole life had been a waste, since he spent several years trying to prove that God wasn't real. Having wasted his whole life, he thought that the right thing to do was to hug the ground. Shuji didn't wish to see him gone, so he decided to become God, and promised to tell him all the things that he wished to know. Saki asked the angels if Shuji could become God, since he had Yonda's arrow inside of him. Ogero told her that the arrow was of no effect, since Shuji was offering himself up to be God. However, it would not be possible to speak with any human. Easley told them that after Shuji is taken to heaven, the rest of the angels would vanish from the earth, and would never be seen again. Shuji began walking towards them, having accepted his fate. As everyone agreed to make him the new God, he began flying towards the sky. At that moment, the angels flew towards him, and lights began exploding around him, as they covered him with their wings, and caused a great light that spread over the city. Shuji announced that he had wiped off the memories of the god candidates from everyone in the world. However, before becoming god, he wondered if they wished to remember everything that has happened. Yuri told him that she wanted no memories of it, and would rather hold Professor Creepy as her new sugar daddy. Yonda said that he still didn't believe in any god, but wished for his memories to remain with him. Mirai also wanted his memories, so Saki asked to keep her own memories too. Suddenly, Shuji began rising higher into the heavens, and entered into a superior being, before vanishing into a light. Yuri began wondering where she was, so Professor Creep told her that they came for their honeymoon, but got caught up in some weird shit. Mirai and Saki held each other's hands, and started walking home. Several years later, Saki told her friends that she would soon be married to Mirai, and that they would own a flower shop together. It had been their lifelong dream, and they were very happy about it. After a few days, Mirai visited Saki's family so he may have their blessing, and they were happy to have him with them. They had always hoped to see them together, and believed that they would be happy forever. That evening in their home, Saki asked Mirai what would make him happy, so he told her that he wants to stay by her side forever. 
When he asked what would make her happy, she said that she was looking to carry his babies. Hoping to hear more of his confessions, she decided to ask what he loved the most about her. So he told her that he loves her smile and hoped to have her close to him forever. A few days later, they got married in a church surrounded by a beautiful heavenly light. Meanwhile in heaven, Shuji was watching everyone on earth, but soon decided to watch sad people. However, after realizing that several humans continued to suffer and were hugging the ground, he thought that Earth was better off not having a god. After telling Ogaro to summon all the angels for a meeting, he stretched his hand, and in that instant, all the angels began to vanish. Having had a miserable human life, Shuji thought that he was useless as god, since he couldn't help humans on Earth. As Ogaro realized this, she saw that god had impaled himself with a great arrow, as everything in heaven began to dispel into a vacuum. On Earth, kids began to vanish, and their clothes were left lying on the spot. Mirai told Saki that it was the end of the world, and he promised to remain with her even after they vanished like they never existed. He was happy to pass on with her, and held her in his arms. 